When a cop takes a pledge to protect people, it normally means to protect them from other people. But sometimes they're called to protect them from the paranormal. And once in a while, they need to protect themselves from those forces. Those are the stories we'll be exploring here tonight. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you like these stories and want to hear more, click on the link to my playlists in the first comment below. The great gods of YouTube really love them some playlists. And who doesn't want to make the gods happy? But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. 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 I've seen a lot of crazy things in my career, from being called to chase a UFO to responding to calls about ghosts. But the most unusual thing that happened to me was witnessed by several other officers. One evening, I brought a guy in for domestic violence. He was being a bit rowdy, so I got some help in booking him by the sergeant and a few other patrolmen. I was in the process of booking Mr. Tough Guy when I happened to glance over at cell number one. There was a guy in there with short hair, glasses, and a white t-shirt, and he was just staring at us. I ignored him and turned back to the task at hand. We finished booking Mr. Tough Guy and I walked him to his cell, walking past cell number one in the process. The guy inside just stood there watching us as we walked by. Then all of us left the booking area and went about our business. Later on, the sergeant asked me to check the paperwork to see if any of the prisoners were ready to be transported to county jail. I grabbed the paperwork and went to do a head count, but I found cell number one was empty. I panicked, and I told the sergeant that a prisoner was missing. Then he panicked, too. We started making phone calls all around to see if anyone had moved the guy or released him without telling us but no one had. Then I checked the computer and the paperwork again, and the head count was accurate, because no one was recorded as being in cell number one. Thoroughly confused, we all went to check the surveillance tape. After finding the point on the tape where I put Mr. Tough Guy in his cell, and we walked past the door of cell number one, the guy inside disappears. He just blinks out of existence. Believe me, we were all freaked out. When we tried to transfer the video to a DVD or a USB drive, the guy in cell number one didn't appear at all. We still hear and see stuff in that cell every now and then, and people in the detox tank are often seen talking to someone in that direction of cell number one, even though it appears empty. To this day, I'm wary of going into booking alone. While working the overnight shift, I answered a call for a welfare check. The neighbor of an old woman called to say that she hadn't seen her in quite a while and she was worried. So I drove over in a thunderstorm to speak to the neighbor first and get some information about what was going on. She told me that the lady next door was in her 90s, lived alone, and hadn't been seen in a week. She explained that she had been calling and knocking on her door, but the woman never answered. My initial thought was that the woman must be dead and had been for quite some time, but I didn't say that to the neighbor. So I went over and took a look. The mail and newspapers had been piling up, and there were no lights on in the home at all. First I walked to the side entrance and I knocked on the door with my flashlight, making it loud enough that maybe an elderly person could hear it. After a few minutes with no response, I went to the backyard to look through the windows but everything seemed okay. The neighbor lady was with me, saying that she didn't know if the woman had any relatives to call for help. By that time, I was sure she was dead, but I pressed on. I walked to the front of the house, and I noticed that the blinds were now open, and I could see a faint glow coming from inside. I wasn't tall enough to see through the windows because they were about seven feet off the ground, so the neighbor lady ran next door to get a bucket for me to stand on. 
I climbed on top of the bucket and looked inside. The glow I saw was from the TV set that was now turned on. It gave off enough light that I could see a little bit around the room, but there was a hallway beyond that that was dark, and I couldn't see anything there. I looked around the floor to make sure she hadn't fallen and was lying there hurt or dead, but the living room was empty. The telephone charging base was blinking red, indicating missed calls and voicemails. I then turned my attention to the dark hallway. Using my flashlight, I could see only an open door down the hall, but still no signs of life. I turned around to tell the neighbor lady that everything looked okay and nothing was disturbed. I then turned back and looked through the window again, and on the other side was the old woman, with her face pressed against the window glass, looking right at me. I was so startled, I fell backwards off the bucket, and I hit the ground hard. The neighbor rushed over to help me up. I quickly got to my feet and climbed back on the bucket. My heart was pounding with fear, but I had to look again. Instinctively, I put my hand on my gun. As I peered through the window, I saw the frail old woman standing in the hallway now, wearing a long nightgown with her back to me. She turned her head slightly and looked at me out of the corner of her eye, then slowly walked out of view and disappeared down the dark hallway. That really unnerved me. I climbed down off the bucket and looked at the neighbor lady, who was standing there with a puzzled look on her face, because she hadn't seen what I saw. All I could tell her was that I saw the woman, and she appeared to be okay. I got in the car and drove back to the PD. I never found out about the lady who lived there, and the neighbor lady never called back, and the house now has new tenants living there. Some things are better left alone. My uncle was a sheriff in a small town in New Mexico. He was the most hardcore person in our family. Super straight-laced, was never a BSer, and really wasn't a joker at all. So when he told us this story, we all believed it without question. A local reporter in town named Bob D. would show up to any major police activity that he heard about on the police scanner. Car crashes, fires, burglaries anything worth printing in the local newspaper. Everyone on the force knew him. He came around at least once or twice a week to various police activities. Bob was a bit of a joker, and he would mess with people by flicking at their ears while standing behind them. People would think it was a bug, only to turn around and see that it was Bob jerking them around. Everybody liked him, though. But sadly, he got lung cancer and he died pretty suddenly. For months after his funeral, people reported seeing Bob at car wrecks, fires, arrests, all the same stuff he used to report on. There were maybe 20 or 30 reports from civilians and police alike, but my uncle didn't buy it. Then one night, my uncle showed up at our house carrying a gun and with my aunt in tow. We asked him what was going on and he had to sit down and compose himself before telling us what happened. He said they were sitting on the couch watching TV, and my uncle kept scratching at his ear over and over again. Finally, my aunt asked him what the problem was, and he turned his head just in time to see Bob D. standing there in the doorway. My uncle got my aunt's attention, and she saw him too. As soon as they both made eye contact with him, Bob smiled, walked across the living room floor, and right out their front door. My uncle grabbed his off-duty gun and ran outside after him, but he was gone. At that point, they ran down to our house, which was a few doors away. Then we all went over to take a look, but we didn't see anything. Regardless, they spent the night at our house that night. At work the next day, my uncle got a lot of I told you so's from his fellow officers. People around town saw Bob for another two to three months. My dad even saw him in our basement darkroom while he was developing photos. Bob was flicking my dad's ears from behind him. 
As time went on, people that saw Bob said his ghost was looking worse and worse. My uncle saw Bob two more times, and he confirmed that each time he was looking more worn out. My dad theorizes that Bob's body was decomposing, and his spirit was reflecting that process. Now, every time my ear itches, I get goosebumps. I responded to a suicide one day. A male had hung himself in the tree in the backyard. We checked the house and all the doors were locked with a deadbolt. So I called in to have entry tools and a supervisor sent over so we could breach the doors and get inside. The decedent's girlfriend was not accounted for and they lived together, so we thought it might be a possible murder-suicide. A few other cops and I were standing at the back door, which had been checked multiple times, waiting for the entry tools to arrive. I looked at the door and I saw there was a gap in the frame, and the deadbolt was no longer engaged. I tried the door, and it opened, so we canceled the order for the tools, then went inside. We cleared the entire house and found no one. I even had them check the attic and basement, but no one was found. Right inside the door that had magically opened were multiple goodbye notes to various family members written by the decedent. After clearing the house, we walked outside and waited for the next of kin to arrive. At one point, we tried to get back inside, but the door was again secured with a deadbolt. It should be noted here that none of us had a key, and there were key locks on both sides of the door, so you couldn't get in or out without a key. The lead detective and I started talking about how we were now going to have to call in a second time for a toolkit. And as we were talking, the door opened all on its own. No one was even standing near it. I had the entire house cleared a second time to make sure no one was inside and messing with us. We searched it top to bottom, but there was no one there at all. The lead detective and I did not go back into the house again that day. I patrol on country roads at night, and one time around 3 a.m., I needed to relieve myself, but the nearest bathroom was 30 minutes away. So I drove down a dark road, got out, and started doing my business. I felt like somebody was watching me, so looking around, maybe 20 feet beyond the rear bumper of my police car, I saw a shadowy figure standing there. I quickly zipped up and yelled out to what I thought was a person, but I got no reply. I began to apologize, thinking it was the landowner coming to see who was peeing on the driveway in the middle of the night, but again, I got no reply. I then fell into tack mode thinking it might be somebody with bad intent. I called out for them to show their hands and identify themselves, but still no answer. I finally got smart and used my flashlight to see who it was, but as soon as the light hit the spot where they were standing, no one was there. Now keep in mind, this entire conversation took about 20 seconds, and I was looking at the figure the entire time, and it hadn't moved. I looked around and saw nothing, nor had I heard anyone running away in the brush. I went back to get in the car, but before I did, I took one last look and saw the shadowy figure quickly moving towards me, from where I had last seen him. I got in my unit and tore the hell out of there, because a gun is not going to protect you from a ghost. A few years back, I took a 911 call from a family reporting that their teenage daughter was possessed. They claimed she took no drugs and had no history of a mental illness, which I, of course, didn't believe for a second. Her family members said that they were holding her down and to please send somebody quickly. 
I could hear two people screaming at each other in the background. I asked the caller to tell whoever was screaming at her to please stop. The caller said, It's her! I responded that yes, I knew she was screaming, but to tell the other person to please stop screaming at her, he was only making it worse. The caller again said, It's her! Both voices! I kid you not, it was the creepiest thing I've ever heard. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've seen a lot. I know man's inhumanity and the horrible things people do to one another. But this, this was a different kind of evil. I was clearly hearing a young girl screaming. At the same time, an adult male voice was yelling back at her, and they were yelling over one another. I couldn't understand what they were saying or even identify the language being used, but there were clearly two different voices, and the family members swore up and down that both voices were coming from her at the same time. It made my skin crawl. My lieutenant listened to the tape later. He looked at me and said, It kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. One year our department started receiving complaints of headstones being knocked over in the local cemetery around Halloween. The chief told all of us working the night shift to make extra passes by the cemetery to hopefully catch the people who were doing the damage. Me being sneaky, I found a good hidden observation point about a block away. There were two major well-lit streets that provided a fair amount of ambient lighting to the cemetery. For several nights in a row, I would park there and check out the cemetery through my binoculars. I would do that twice a night, once at the start of my shift and once at the end. One night while checking out the cemetery, I saw something that looked like a cat walking on its hind legs. I watched as this thing walked about ten feet between headstones, then I lost sight of it. I rushed over to the area in my patrol car, and I turned on the spotlights, alley lights, and takedown lights. But I didn't see anything. All I found were paw-like tracks left behind in the dew on the grass that ended at the headstone. To this day, I can remember the strange way it moved and its outline in my binoculars. It was so creepy. I'm an avid hunter and have done plenty of night hunting, and I'm very familiar with all the animals in my neck of the woods, and I've never seen anything like that before or since. One cold winter night around 3 a.m., I was parked behind a Kmart in the dark doing my paperwork. Suddenly, someone or something banged loudly on the driver's side window two or three times. Scared the hell out of me. Except, there was nobody there. I looked around, and to my left was a 15-foot wall, and to my right, a 10-foot solid fence. Where I was parked, there was a hundred feet of open space both in front and behind my unit. On the ground was nothing but my own tire tracks and the blanket of fresh snow, and there were no marks on my window to indicate that someone had thrown a snowball or a rock. I even got out and knelt down in the snow to look under my car, but I found nothing. I still get anxious every time I have to patrol back there, to this day. My father was a cop, and he was driving down a country road one night when he noticed some guy with a motorcycle stood on the side of the road. It was late, and a very dangerous place to be stranded, so Dad pulled over to see if he could help. He asked the guy what was wrong, and he said his bike cut out and wouldn't restart. After some back and forth, 
Dad decided to return to the police van to grab some tools. But when he returned, the motorcycle and the man were both gone. Dad looked around and listened for the sound of footsteps or a motor, something to tell him where this guy went. But there was nothing. In just those few moments that my dad took to go to the van, this man had vanished. Dad called out into the night air in case the guy had pushed his bike out of sight somewhere. But he quickly realized this was a country road and there was nowhere for the guy to disappear to so quickly and with a heavy bike in tow. Dad said he freaked out, got back in the van and got out of there as fast as he could. He said the weirdest part was that he physically touched the guy and the bike. A few days later, he mentioned it to a colleague, and it turns out that a few years back, a biker had been killed in an accident on that road. Apparently, he's far from the first person to see that ghost. He hates talking about it, even now. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for being part of my family of darkness. Now click or tap on the screen above to hear more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends. <laughs>